thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank IFRI for inviting IFDC to take part in this uh, discussion. And uh, I feel privileged to be asked to go first because I thought I would be the last one uh, to summarize everything. But uh, let me set the stage, and I thought Nick was first, so he will give you the rationale about why subsidies are needed. But what I'm going to talk is about market-friendly alternatives to input subsidies and much more focus on fertilizers, because among all the key inputs, the fertilizer is the most capital-intensive and has also generated a lot of discussion and debate how should we increase fertilizer use in Africa. Uh, three questions here. Why do we need alternative to subsidies? Uh, why should alternatives be market-friendly? What are the market-friendly alternatives to subsidies? And what should be the way forward in terms of the research and the action both? Now, briefly, uh, there is a need for fertilizers. And there is a lot of uh, controversy and discussion in the 90s. Uh, if you look at, you can divide the agriculture systems into two parts. One is called the closed agroecological system, like uh, rainforest, Amazon, where the nutrients get recycled and taken over. In the open agroecological systems, you remove nutrients from the field, which means nutrients should be replaced, replenished. If you don't replenish, then you have the soil degradation, basically. And you can replace, replenish the nutrients either by organic sources, inorganic sources, or biological. But the bottom line is that the nutrients you are removing, you have to replenish if you want to sustain the crop production. If you don't do that, then naturally the crop production will go down. Then the third area is the food security challenge in the sense that some countries you need to increase the production from the same amount of land. The land is constrained, and so you want to shift the production function, as the economists call it, which means you want to get more output from the same area. You need to put the nutrients, and the high yielding varieties will not yield high yields if the nutrients are not there in the soil. So there is a need for fertilizers, very briefly. Now, the next question is that let's look at the farming population in sub-Saharan Africa, and then we would be able to identify the tools and the instruments we need to target each one of them. A, the big sector is the export estate crop growers. This sector doesn't have any problem in getting the inputs, and most of them work as interlocked markets. The companies supply the inputs, they buy the product. Next one is the large commercial farmers who have access to finance. Third group is small-scale viable farmers, which are linked to the market marginally, grow maybe two to five hectares of land, but they do not have access to finance. And then the last group is subsistence farmers, which are producing mostly for home consumption and selling little bit in the market. Now, this is the basic uh, graph which I use, uh, economists use. <laughs> a demand and supply curve. And if you look at uh, the D curve is going down, we see that as the prices go down, the farmers are going to use more fertilizers. On the S curve goes upward, as the prices go up, the suppliers will supply more. And then there is a point A, which says that where the quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. And therefore, this is the equilibrium price in economics term. Now, and this is the main argument which the policymakers use in Africa is that the prices are at P1 level, price is very high. So let's introduce subsidies and reduce the price to P2. Now, when you do that, three things happen. A, that you have artificially reduced the price. At that price, the suppliers are not willing to supply as much as it is needed. Your quantity demanded jumps from Q1 to Q2, so there is excess demand. Now, to meet the excess demand at that price, you have to bring the interventions. Either you do the rationing, you say, well, every farmer will get one bag of urea or half a bag of urea. And when you do that one, then you introduce uh, uh, sort of you know, rent seeking. It comes. So the decision making goes in the hands of the policymakers and the politicians. So we have excess demand at that point. And this is the difference. The P1, P2 is the subsidy. So three things happen. A, you are creating excess demand, which means you are bringing the government back into the allocation mechanism that you introduce rationing. You create fiscal burdens, a higher quantity, 
And third is that, you know, you introduce the rent seeking. So the, there are two objectives here we should remember. A, you want to reduce the price for the farmers. And B, you want to reach more number of farmers than they will be able to go in the market. Now, given these limitations, which I said that A, it distorts the market, then <coughs> prevents the development of the competitive market. It creates fiscal burdens and promotes rent seeking and political interference. Now, because of these limitations of subsidy, we need an alternative approach to reduce both the fertilizer price and also help the smallholder farmers. Now, in spite of current crisis, the global crisis we see, the markets are still the most efficient and effective means to produce and distribute goods and services, provided they are properly monitored and regulated. Remember, this is a very important, I think, in many African countries when we moved from public sector monopoly to private sector, the quality control system was not put in place and the regulatory mechanism were not there. And therefore, we say, well, if you don't want to subsidize, what can we do, basically? So it should be a market-friendly mechanism. Now, there are four options I suggest, and probably I would not be able to elaborate all of them in the time constraint, but during the discussion, we can come. One is reduce the supply price by shifting the supply curve to the right, which you call the SSCR approach. Second, provide purchasing power support, PPS, to resource-poor farmers through vouchers. Third is make social investment in acidic soils. And fourth, improve infrastructures. Now, this is the same graph which I introduced in the beginning, that either we reduce price from P1 to P2 by giving a subsidy and artificially bringing the rationing, or we move this supply curve from S1 to S2. And if you look at from S1, when you move the S2, then at point C, you find that the price has been decreased and the quantity has increased. Now we are using the Q2 quantity. There is no distortions in the market. So that, that is one mechanism that can we reduce the price without interfering in the market? Can we shift the supply curve to the right? Now the three areas where you need to make the improvements. A, strengthen the five pillars of market development. Second, promote multi-country markets. In Africa, many of the countries have a very small size of market, and when they go to the global market, it creates difficulty for them to access fertilizers. And rationalize fertilizer products and recommendations. Now, these are the five pillars of market. A, that you need to create a conducive policy environment. B, develop human capital at all levels, at the retail, the wholesale, and the import level. Access to finance. And this is the area where we have the most difficulty. In most African countries, it, you require about 150 to 200 percent collateral to get the finance. As a result, the importers don't have access to finance, which means they have to go for a smaller quantity. In most of the Asian countries, you can get a letter of credit with 30 percent down, basically. Now, if you introduce a risk-sharing mechanism such that 30, 30, 40, which means A, the dealer or the importer will provide 30% of the money needed for importing. The bank will take the 40% risk, and 30% will be guaranteed to the bank from some source. Then now you have increased the size of money available to import by three to four folds, about the same amount of money. Now what the commercial bank can do to relax or to reduce their risk is take the fertilizer as a collateral. So when you import, like Exim Bank in Tanzania is doing right now, you take the commodity as a collateral against the future and reduce the collateral requirement. So that's the one area where maybe in the discussion we can elaborate a bit more, but improving access to finance is important. Then market transparency, market information is very critical, and the regulatory system. So I think in these five areas, if you make the improvement, then it will be easy to shift the supply curve to the right, which means you will reduce the price. Now, this is an example which has both uh, multi-country market as well as uh, the product specification and improving product recommendations. Now, if you look at four countries and look at the second number, this says the first Mali uses 14, the product they use is called cotton formula. They use 14 units of nitrogen, 22 units of phosphate, 12 units of potash, 7 sulfur, and 1 boron. But look at the middle column, 22, 23, 24, 23. It's 100% artificial product differentiation. 
these countries don't need different products, basically. Agroecologically, they are the same. These products were introduced in the colonial period to benefit the manufacturers, not the farmers. Now, what happens, each country goes to the market with small quantity, they pay two to three times higher price. If you rationalize the product and have one product for all these four countries, you are increasing the size of the market from, you know, uh, say about 20, 30, 40,000 tons to about 100 to 120,000 tons, which means you have economies of scale in procurement and you have benefits in the nutrient use efficiency. Now, phosphorus dynamics are such that you really don't have to be that precise that the plant will care whether you have 1% less or more. Because typically in phosphorus, the plant doesn't take more than 10% of applied fertilizers, 10 to 12%. If you apply DAP, TSP, SSP, anything, which means another 80 to 90 percent stays in the soil. Part of it stays for the future use. You can take it like money in the bank. Another part will disappear, will be fixed by the soils. So I think this, this kind of differentiation, this is one example where you can create a multi-country market, have the economies of scale in procurement, and reduce the price significantly. The market development is necessary, but not sufficient for improving food security in rural areas. This is the second option. Market development efforts should be supported by purchasing power support to incl include poor people in the market. Now this is a big difference here, and this is what I think the voucher system will come in. Subsidies for a product. When you are giving a subsidy on a product, which means you are distorting the market, you are introducing rationing and the rent seeking and everything. So we say move from product to the people. The purchasing power support for inputs is for the people. Empowering people to participate in the marketplace through input vouchers kills two birds with one stone, alleviate hunger and poverty, and develop input markets. And therefore, the second message I want to give is support the people, not the product, which means we should move. OK, two minutes quickly. Yeah. Now, we should be very clear that when you introduce voucher system or any mechanism when you're supporting people, A, it should not be a free, free lunch. B, it should not be free for all, because I already told you that there are four groups, and the first three groups may not need the subsidy, basically. They can, you know, the first two don't need at all, the third group need access to finance, and the fourth group is where you have to focus the support. It should be targeted, and it should be administered through voucher program and include the exit plan. This is the three key groups here for the voucher system is farmers, the dealers, and the bankers, and you have to work with all of them and maybe in the discussion I can elaborate, elaborate a bit more. The third area where we can make improvement that in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, like northern Zambia, southern Tanzania, western Kenya, the soils are very acidic. Now, acidic soils will not give you results for fertilizers. Whatever phosphate fertilizers you put will be absorbed by the soils, so plant will not get anything. Now, this is a long-term investment, also require a large amount of investment, you know. One bag or two bag of lime or phosphate rock will not solve the problem. You need at least, you know, 20 or 30 bags to fix the problem. So we say, finish, you know, focus on the areas where the pH is very low and make the investment in improving the soil health. And since investment in liming and other soil amendments may not yield short-term results, a social investment may be necessary. So you can divert your funds from direct subsidies to this area and improve the, uh, the quality of soils. Infrastructure improvement, very quickly, we can debate, you know. I mean, Africa is a big continent. You can put India, China, and USA, still you will be left with a lot of land go for safari. Uh, you will never be able to develop the infrastructure, integrate the whole thing. So let's look at the short terms. What can you do? Just one example I give you. Here, is the figure is not very clear. But this is a triangle which covers southern Tanzania, northern Zambia, and northern Malawi. Now, for Zambia and Malawi, the product is coming from South Africa, which costs you a lot of money. For Ambeya, which is in southern Tanzania, which is a bread basket, you're coming on from Dar es Salaam on the Tajara railway line. If we develop that as a market of the three countries in that area and see the difference we can make, you're getting the product from Johannesburg to Lusaka, Lusaka to Kasama in northern Zambia. It cost you $225, just in transportation. I'm not talking of anything else. If you get the same product from Dar es Salaam, you get 
there is a big savings in the transportation cost. Now, why we cannot get that uh, is right now, on the Tajara railway line, you don't have a covered railway wagon. So most of the product goes by trucks. And when you move it by trucks or road, it's very costly and it doesn't go across the border. Again. So if you make a small investment in improving the port in Dar es Salaam and also improving the Tajara railway line, then you reduce the cost of uh, product substantially. You know, here is, this is only, you know, not looking at the five pillars of market, not looking at the voucher, just the transportation. You're sourcing the product from a different source. Rather than Johannesburg, you're getting it from Dar es Salaam. So finally, I conclude. Okay, very quickly. Uh, these are the, the way forward. And in that order, to reduce the price and to reach larger number of people, A, strengthen the development of input markets by shifting the supply curve to the right, empower the people to participate in the market process through purchasing power support, make social investment in acidic soils, <coughs> and improve infrastructure. And I think we should focus on the, the infrastructure, the short term, the small improvements which can make a big difference, not the big infrastructures, which will take a long time. And then promote public-private partnership. This is the area. I think the time is gone when either public sector alone can do the job or private sector alone can do the job. We had that in the 70s, public sector, in the 90s, the private sector. But I think it's a partnership you need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.